Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Good afternoon. My name is Bob McDonald, and I'm the former governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'm a businessman. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Um, I also uh, teach at some universities, Liberty University and Regent University here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, where I still reside here on the East Coast. And um, it's a pleasure to be with you today, and I welcome those from the uh, San Francisco Commonwealth Club and those of you from around the country that may be watching today as I join my good friend, Ben Jealous as uh, he previews and talks about his book, Never Forget, Our People Were Always Free. Uh, you know, Ben is uh, a friend. I've known him for 10 years. When I was governor, we worked together on some important issues in Virginia, where he and I both have very deep roots. And that's part of the reason I think that he wrote this book as a kind of a reconciliation with his uh, home uh, of his family. It goes back uh, quite a few generations here in the Commonwealth. And, uh, you know, Ben has had an incredibly distinguished career in business. He was the youngest ever president of the national NAACP. He's been an, uh, an author uh, previously. He's been heavily involved in government and politics and trying to change not only the tone of politics, but change pol policies uh, for uh, the better. He ran for governor of Maryland a couple of years ago. And uh, continue to stay active in the body, body politic in a number of ways. And it's just a tremendous uh, thinker, orator, and somebody committed to healing the divides in so many ways that face our country. So I'm glad that he is here today. I want to just make one editorial uh, note, uh, and that is that uh, the Commonwealth Club is going to be returning to a more in-person uh, programmatic uh, agenda with some of its San Francisco headquarters program. You can learn more about them if you'd like or special events for members at the club's website at www.commonwealthclub.org. And I want to remind you, I have a number of questions for Ben about his uh, book. He'll have a lot to say uh, about uh, you know, what he is trying to accomplish in this book, which I think is a, a seminal book for this time in modern America. Uh, but I'd like to entertain your questions and not just mine. So if you'd like, you can go and uh, hit the chat function on your uh, on your Zoom link and you'll be able to ask questions. Those will be fed to me and I'll intersperse questions of yours with mine along the way for Ben. So uh, I can't think of much more important things to talk about in America today than how we heal the racial uh, divide uh, for a lot of obvious reasons that have played out on the streets uh, and the legislatures uh, and the boardrooms of America over this last uh, three and a half years, perhaps not since the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, whose birthday was celebrated yesterday, have we seen as much uh, divide, but also as much interest in trying to find uh, solutions across the body politic. And Ben's uh, book is incredibly uh, timely in this area as he looks and traces back uh, literally centuries of history uh, about the interactions of black and white here in the new world, the United States of America. Um, and uh, I, I think it really prompts our thinking about where did we go from here, cognizant of the history that we cannot forget. Uh, and Ben's perspective, I think, is so refreshing and unique that it's a voice that must be heard and discussed here in America today. So, um, Ben, I want to say welcome, my friend. Uh, ah, so thank you, Bob. Together here, uh, black, white, Republican, Democrat, but first and foremost, friends, not only because of our links to Virginia, but because of the common ground you and I have tried to find on so many issues uh, that I think is something that's uh, in dire need here in a, in a country uh, today. So I want to introduce my friend Ben, and I, I guess Ben, a great place to start. Your book has had tremendous 
tremendous acclaim. Uh, you've gotten uh, a lot of attention on both conservative and liberal media. Uh, you have uh, presented your ideas that certainly are very thought provoking, but you've done it with such a civil and, uh, and uh, important uh, tone of trying to bring people together, not to divide. That's, I think it's incredibly refreshing in America today. So give us a start. Tell us what was the genesis of the book? Why did you write the book? And what are you hoping to accomplish with this book? Well, thank you, Bob. It's, it's great to be with you. And I just want to say hello to all my friends in the Bay Area. I'm sure some have joined from my years in tech and from my years as president and now chairman of the Rosenberg Foundation in San Francisco. And um, you may not, it might be a surprise to some uh, that Bob and I are good friends. I think we all get caricatured in this society, but Bob really showed courage in helping to re-enfranchise formerly incarcerated people in Virginia. When I asked as president of the NAACP, his predecessor who was a Democrat did not. Um, and I remain just deeply appreciative of that. And as General Powell told me when I was young, as I discussed in my book, never forget our people were always free. Most important thing you can do in this society is to figure out what you can agree with somebody on and then build on that. And we also, uh, I think, moved part of what motivated both of us was our belief that people have a right to redeem themselves. You know, not everybody, I mean, this, that nobody should be simply have their entire life defined by the worst thing they did on the worst day and that everybody can you know, uh, move to a higher plane, uh, as well as our shared, as well as our shared Christian faith. Well, I thought I would start just by reading a bit from the book, just to ground people who may not have bought the book yet. As a child, I soaked up my grandmother's stories, like cornbread soaks up butter mixed with maple syrup. My grandmother, like every woman we knew of before her in her bloodline, was the family griot. She was the one who told stories over and over while she cooked, while we ate, while we played cards, while we sat on the beach. She was a veteran statewide leader in the war on poverty and a local soldier in the civil rights movement. Usually she told her tales and those of her parents and grandparents as a form of instruction. Like an old general, she didn't expect you to fight in the same ways as she had or they had. Her faith, however, was that if you knew how she fought her battles, then you would find yourself better prepared in the future fight. Sometimes, however, her statements were riddles she hoped you would be inspired to solve, like the one about colonial rebellions. Other times, she made claims that were ridiculous on their face and then confounded you with her insistence not to be contradicted. Never forget our people were always free. She'd offer as a diversion from the subject at hand. She often seemed to insert as an offhand closer to a conversation about some sensitive aspect of our family's history and slavery about which she did not want to hear more discussion. When I was a kid, it made my brain hurt. It just didn't make any sense. When I was a teenager, I decided to challenge her head on. What are you talking about, Mimi? Three of your four grandparents were born into slavery. The fourth was a white man, your own sister says, raped one of your grandmothers. He was free, the rapist. She just stared at me like she pitied me. She would never say a curse word, but by the look on her face, I'd say she thought me either an idiot or a word I won't say on the Zoom. Ultimately, I relented, challenging it seemed as cruel and futile as an atheist trying to convince a devout nun that Mary was not a virgin. Mm -hmm. Historically, the women in many families, and the griots in the West African tradition, don't just hand down important stories. They hand down traditions, religion, recipes for success, and the peculiar convictions and articles of faith that make a family a family and a tribe a tribe. This, I reasoned, must be one of the latter two. But my inspiration for writing this book was my grandmother. She lived to be 105 years old, and a couple of years ago, she was chronologically dying. It was just she wasn't going to live forever. She had these powerful stories, but she also left us... Um, these riddles. And the biggest one was the title of the book, 
never forget our people were always free. I dug into it in the process. I really did a lot of healing. Bob and I serve on the Virginia State's Commonwealth Commission for Racial Reconciliation. Uh, and yet, as much as any of us can preach about it, it's something we have to do personally. And uh, ultimately, that saying, it appears, is a battle cry handled, handed down uh, by the very first woman on the grandmother's maternal line to be enslaved. It's more about that woman in the book. But um, getting there, man, you know, I mean, there was a moment about I had to walk away from my computer because I figured not only was I cousins to Dick Cheney, which I was prepared for because Obama's cousins to Dick Cheney. So I knew that was a possible thing, I guess. But then I figured out I was cousins to Robert E. Lee. And, uh, well, I had to stop writing for a couple of days. You know? <laughs> it's not what a former president of the NAACP expects to find in their deal. Ben, you've got an interesting family history. Uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, you've got deep roots in Virginia going back well over a century. Or, uh, and More like four. It goes, it goes all the way back. You know, you know, but, but I figured out I was then from William Randolph who they called the Adam of the Commonwealth because his 12 children married into all the other founding families. So yeah, it's a, yeah, it's so, back very, home in a profound way. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that and why now for writing this uh, book, you know, of uh, you've known these stories for quite some time, but you told me once, this is kind of your reconciliation with Virginia. You fled to Maryland a while back, but uh, this is your chance, you know, Virginia, the home of the Confederacy, but yet the home of the first black governor of Virginia, uh, of the United States, you know, yeah. Doug Wilder. Doug Wilder, oh, yes. Tell us yeah, about you know, it. Yeah. There was a study once done about rats and an electric cube. You put rats in a shoebox and then they electrified the cube. And it was four generations before their, I guess their great, great, great grandchildren climbed back up on that cube, it just stayed away. And Virginia was the electric cube for us. It's where our family had been enslaved for hundreds of years. And you know, I've, I've lived, if I haven't lived in California and I wasn't in school, I was generally living here in this region. I've lived in Maryland, lived in DC, much of my adult life. And folks are like, why don't you just move to Virginia for this reason, for that? I was like, no, my family ran away twice. I hate going back. Um, and yet, you know, the cousin, Thomas Jefferson, founded UVA. My grandmother's grandfather uh, was one of the architects of Virginia State. And I realized that I didn't understand a lot except for the pain. The pride, it's a lot of pride in the family, but also the pain. And these two things were actually kind of nebulous. I didn't understand the real fine talking points for the pride or the real fine talking points for the pain. And I decided to dive into both. and. What I found really, really changed my life. You know, the, um, the biggest sort of headline was I had known that my grandmother's grandfather um, had played a role in, in founding Virginia State, come out of slavery and helped build the university and been in the state legislature. What I didn't realize was that he had built a third party with a former Confederate general called the Readjusters because. After the end of Reconstruction, yet before the beginning of Jim Crow, and this kind of transition gap, working class whites fled the Democratic Party because uh, the, planta the old plantation owning class was saying they were going to shut down the free public schools because they couldn't afford the Civil War debt. And so they formed their own party called the Readjusters, demanding the state readjust the terms of the Civil War debt with the federal government to maintain the free public schools. And my grandmother's grandfather, as the leader of the Black Republicans, at the time in, in Virginia, approached him, uh, this general, General William B. Mahone, who would be basically pulled out of the history of the, of the Confederacy as maintained by the daughters of the Confederacy, ultimately because they thought him a race traitor after he made this deal with my grandmother's grandfather, who approached him and said, hey, like we want to keep the schools open too. How do we work together? Long story short, my grandmother's grandfather led blacks into that party, and that party as it rose to ultimately take control of the governorship, both houses and uh, both U.S. senatorships, became a majority black party led by a former Confederate general and a freeman. And 
they never taught us that. Uh, they never taught us that there was a time when the men who, quote, fought to preserve slavery, and it's much more complex for the guys who didn't own slaves, a lot of them just fighting to defend their home, uh, and the men who were enslaved got together for anything, let alone got together, took over the state government, radically expanded Virginia Tech, making it the working person's rival to UVA, created Virginia State, the first public HBCU south of Mason-Dixon, abolished the public whipping post, abolished the poll tax. Um, I can't imagine how my view of what is possible in this country would have been different if I had been told there was a time uh, that those two sides got together in the interest of all their children. It left me with a profound sense of hope, greater kind of clarity about what my grandmother's pride was and also the pain, because the pain that my grandmother was reeling from was her, was her grandfather's pain, which was seeing that party destroyed uh, and their dreams uh, with it, and yet remaining very proud because the, at the very least, the institutions that they built continued to stand. Um, and they laid the groundwork for FDR's coat. Alicia in the state decades later. Ben, in the book, you talk a little bit about some of your experiences living in your in New York and interactions with law enforcement that kind of shaped your views. And then as uh, you get to sort of the crescendo of your book, you say the profound statement that, uh, you know, we may have come here to America on different boats, but we're all in the same boat now. So explain to the uh, the audience here, how does how did you shape that view and what, what impact does that have on public policy going forward? You know, that's something I heard Jesse Jackson say, I believe um, Dr. King had said, and yet it's like, it's like rhetoric. And then when you really deal with your DNA and you dig into it, you deal with the history, you know, I, I had a moment um, that where I was holding the will of the man who had owned my grandmother's grandfather in my hands. And there was a full paragraph of that will. The only will referencing an enslaved person was about my grandmother's great-grandfather, her grandfather's dad. And Henry Louis Gates Jr. helped me understand that what that paragraph reflected was that the owner knew that, that his manservant, as he referred to him, was his older brother by six years. And he was trying to limit the way that the man might be mistreated without, short of freeing him. And that helped me understand that even a slave owner could understand that this was his family. It, as grave as the injustice of, of slavery is, it didn't completely build a wall between, you know, against just the human reckoning with the fact that this is your brother and you have a responsibility to him. The, um, all that's to say that if that the sooner we act like we're one American family, the, you know, the better off we'll be. And figuring out that my grandmother's grandfather, when he walked out of slavery, the battle of Appomattox knew that, for example, that General Lee was his cousin helped to explain his hubris that I've struggled to understand. How's a guy, you know, walk out of slavery at 17 and is leading a political party by 35, you know, runs against his white cousin, beats him. Well, part of that had to be the sense of entitlement that comes from knowing, like, we got the same blood, man. Like, yeah, I'm a different color than you. You know, I started off life at a different station than you. But why should I think myself any less deserving than you? Like, you know, I'm... Paternal line is identical in a patriarchal society at that. So, so it was, you know, um, digging into the history helped me, I think, see ultimately the, the, the urgency for us to recognize that we're all more connected and to act like we're in the same boat now. You know, Ben, it's been 403 years since the first uh, enslaved Africans came off the white line slave ship just a few miles from where I'm sitting right now, Hampton. Uh, Virginia. And here we are still talking about the sort of the legacy of slavery and still talking about how do we how do we heal? So what do you hope your book does to help move that dialogue along and help us to make progress? Yeah, I hope that for everybody, it, it sends them um, really 
going into their own heart to figure out how, um, how they get the courage to move forward together, to start talking to people that they might otherwise just turn a deaf ear to, start listening you know, to people, um, and ultimately practicing the golden rule in a, you know, with courage. I, um, I was kind of yanked sort of towards Virginia in a way by a woman I met. At, she was from San Francisco, from the, the Bay Area, grown up in San Francisco, but was born in Petersburg, Virginia. And we met at Renaissance Weekend, not like the knights and ladies kind of thing, but the thing that the Clintons used to organize. And we were sitting there at dinner, and I, you know, I had a couple of cocktails and had a glass of wine and was talking to this very nice gentleman. And I just was just prodding, like, where are y'all from? Like, where are y'all really from? I know you've seen you from Los Gatos, but my wife, like, where are y'all really from? And he finally said his wife's from Petersburg. And I was like, oh, my family's from Petersburg. I was like, what are your wife's family names? Because, you know, Virginians were like that. And he said, um, well, her maiden name is Bland. I said, wait, 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 that's my, what's her name? He said, Maggie Bland. I said, oh, my grandmother's Mamie Bland. She looks a little, you know what, sir, I, I don't know how to say this, but I think your wife's family used to own my mama's family. Well, Bob, he was from Minnesota. He had no, like, he, he had no preparation for the contradictions that we saw in the Mason Dixon live with all the time, you know, and the curiosities. So he switched seats with her. And then I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, what did I just do? And she's in my face scrutinizing me. She was in her 80s. She's just staring at me. And all of a sudden she goes, come here, baby, give me a kiss. I always knew I had black family. I've been looking for you all since I was 12. (laughs) What had happened was she moved to Pacific Heights in San Francisco, where probably a few of our viewers live. And uh, when she was a small child during the Great Depression, uh, sorry, her family had moved to Pack Heights, excuse me, before she was born. She was born in Pack Heights. Her mom had moved to Pack Heights with her brothers. Her brothers were like 16 and 18 years older than her. They were a very antebellum family. Her brothers once dueled until they drew blood because one of them brought Abraham Lincoln's biography into the house of the Pacific Heights. And her mom was 42 when she was born and was trying to ingratiate herself in San Francisco high society and didn't want to be bogged down by a baby. So she called back to Petersburg to have Mammy sent. And Maggie Plant looked to me, she said, I said, you know, how'd you know you had black family? So, because on the party line, when my mom and her sisters were squabbling, she could squash an argument in 20 seconds flat. And the Bland family, only blood can do that. Well, the rest of the story's in the book, but, you know, it's just, when I was a kid, they were still denying that Sally Hemings was a thing over at Monticello, but, you know, their cousin Thomas Jefferson. To hear her just own the fact that she had black family and not act like it was a recent revelation, but that she had grown up understanding that she had black family in a family that was so clearly tied to the old South, so much so that her brothers were dueling over Abraham Lincoln's biography and the and the affront of the family to bring it into the to the to the house. I think that started the healing. And so I, I ultimately want everybody, we all have those little boxes that are locked up in our heart because of old hurts that may have happened to our family at some point. And unlocking those ultimately gives us, accelerates the healing process in us and empowers us to to do so with others. And more than anything, that's why I want to encourage people who read this book to unlock those boxes in their own heart uh, and really act with courage to build a stronger communities and a stronger country through listening. You know, Ben, you said a couple of things really important. You know, I've had these uh, faith discussions uh, before, but you said two things in your last thing. So one, you pointed out absolutely right that these these issues of racial healing and the reconciliation are ultimately matters of the heart. And you also mentioned uh, the great universal uh, the great universal principle of the golden rule. You know, I, you look at society today, only 47 percent of people say they go to church now. It's the lowest we've had in about 75 years in the country. So can can this healing of the heart and ultimately then in conduct and then ultimately in law, can that occur without an active church? Or what do you think the role is of people of faith to try to make this uh, divide go away? Yeah. As an organizer for a long time, I've encouraged people across the political spectrum, one, to listen to each other as people of faith, because it's one of the easiest ways to find common ground. We are a very religious society, whether people are Christians, Jews or Muslims or Buddhists. America is just 
people at the end of the week are in a house of worship. The, uh, and, the, and the other is to speak from that um, in a way that's natural for them. Certainly on the left, a lot of us don't speak in terms of our faith. We haven't for a long time. But I read a piece by a Jewish activist a long time ago who just who was lamenting the voice of King in the public square and saying that King speaking as a person of faith never made him feel less than as a Jew. It actually affirmed him as a person of faith and affirmed the golden rule that's central to all of our faiths. Mm-hmm. And fundamentally, you know, it's like you and I working together courageously in Virginia to re-enchantize formerly incarcerated people in a state that was one of only two with a lifetime ban on it, on for people who had committed felonies being able to vote. Um, you know, both of us were motivated by things that we had learned in Sunday school as kids, you know, just kind of basic values, basic notions of right. And also uh, the important, you know, it was, was much more in Tim Kaine's interest as a Democrat, for example, at least certainly understandably in the public narrative. When you go into prisons, you and I both know there's a lot of Republicans in prison, a lot of poor white guys who were early areas in prison. You know, there's a lot of Democrats in prison. It's not as, not as partisan as some people might imagine. But um, certainly as a Democrat, it'd be much easier to explain to him than it was as a Republican. And yet, Bob, what I loved about you know, that first meeting was that it was clear that there were basic religious principles that motivated you to have courage in that moment that were important to you. And they were the same ones that were important to me. It didn't matter like party, you know, it mattered ultimately character. And uh, we've got to give ourselves the chance to see that in each other. I talk in the book about a man who has a Confederate flag over his heart. And as the former president, well, at the time I was the national president of NAACP, he was like the last guy I wanted to be sitting next to in first class. I had no idea what that conversation was going to be like, but it's going to end up being a conversation about multi generational poverty, that his family had been trapped in since the Georgia Penal Colony, and what might be done to get the boys out of it who kept going to, to prison. And that's the thing that I think sometimes it's hard for people to understand, but I, Professor John Powell over at UC Berkeley uh, is focused on this um, for our Bay Area audience. That the media right now makes the white poor invisible, makes white inmates invisible. And so people's imagination is twisted about what's actually happening. There are 8 million changed blacks in poverty. There's 16 million changed whites in poverty and roughly equal numbers of men's behind bars. And the lawyers always want to focus on percentages. But as an organizer, um, as somebody who's active in their church outreach ministry, helping the poor, what we actually focus on are numbers, just the raw numbers. How many households to serve? How many families to organize? Um, and there's a lot of pain in the white community. And as I talk about in the book, when we make it visible, it shifts policy. We did that with opiate addiction. When the faces of young white people, oftentimes mothers, dying from opiate addiction became visible, public sentiment moved to much greater sympathy. Because the largest part of the population saw themselves reflected in the problem. And it's just, it's, it's important to show the full faith, face, the full face of any problem if we're actually going to get to an effective solution. All right, Ben, the softball questions are over. I'm going to ask you a tough political question. <laughs> sure, please. Uh, you know, both parties throughout the history of our country, from the revolutions of today, have had times of uh, honor and times of times of, uh, you know, trouble when it comes to issues of race. Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, uh, at the end of the war, we have three constitutional amendments that, uh, at least on paper and in the Constitution, do a lot towards racial integration. A hundred years later, it's Republican senators from the South that helped Johnson push the Civil Rights Act uh, through. You know, but in recent years, uh, whether it's issues of crime, or uh, immigration or social welfare policies. Uh, people of color have been voting disproportionately for the Democratic Party, thinking that their policies are better, voting rights, et cetera. So it seems like neither party has got necessarily a monopoly on the solution. So Certainly not historically. <laughs> Adam here, Ben, is, uh, is this. Uh, can we really solve this problem through the political process, or do we need to find solutions that work outside the political system? Now, all the solutions really come up uh, from community, through congregations, through businesses, through community-serving organizations. 
the stuff that comes top down is like arguments on Twitter, you know, um, the stuff that comes bottom up is really grounded uh, in the common sense that often defines the, the, the common wisdom as espoused on social media. And, uh, and that's where my faith is. You know, I, I've worked uh, as an investor with Mitch Kapor over in Oakland. I was a partner in his investment firm for five years. And we, both Democrats, backed a lot of market-based solutions to solve test social problems that, frankly, government still hasn't solved. I'll give you an example. There's a company called Pigeonly. They are owned by two formerly incarcerated men who sold a lot of marijuana back in the day when it was highly illegal. Uh, and came home, Bob, with a hole in their heart because it was so hard to stay in touch with family, so expensive. We at the NAACP have been fighting with the FCC to try to get them to cut the rate of inmates calling home from prison by 50%. And we would have taken 25% and called it a step in the right direction. These guys cut it 80% with essentially building Google Voice, if you will, for inmates, applying voice over you know, IP technology. Um, so I think there's actually increasing consensus, including from a lot of Democrats, especially in tech, that there are things we can do through the marketplace that we would be fools to weigh on, on government to do. Um, at the same time, you know, I live in one of the most conservative communities in Maryland. My town has been called the most racist community in Maryland by the Washington Post, who honestly, I don't think has ever come out here. Uh, they're just looking at some hate crime stats, and two of those reports are from my house. And also out here is Kathy Hughes, who owns Radio One and TV One. We both love Pasadena. We rave about it all the time. And what I know from living here, uh, especially during COVID, when I really got to know my neighbors, because we just all walking our new puppies, um, was, uh, you know, that my neighbors, including many who voted for Trump, we actually have very similar concerns when it comes to our kids, uh, very similar concerns about our community, about our state. and. Um, to me, that's, that's where the solutions come. The problem is politicians in highly gerrymandered districts flying to Washington and then running around said gerrymandered district. And at some point, they seem to stop listening uh, to the diversity of people in their greater community. You know, Ben, you've got you talked a little bit about your family and the influencers of this book, everybody from your... Uh, Dave Chappelle, I think your godmother's son or your godfather's son, and then you've got uh, your your grandmother, uh, tremendously powerful with this concept of that we were always free, which changes the worldview. But some people, you know, don't don't have that, don't have the connection with their family. So who are the role models we point to? Is it a Frederick Douglass? Is it a Martin Luther King that found ways to bring people together? Who do we look to? Uh, for some of the audience, and maybe business people, maybe in other, uh, you know, circumstances where they haven't had a, a a real influencer on racial harmony and racial reconciliation, uh, who would you hold up? I mean, you talk a lot about this in your book. Yeah, you know, I um, I think that it's really on all of us at this point, and uh, a lot of the work needs to be done in our congregations. The um, in the book, interestingly, I end up praising, if you include a, one lieutenant governor, five Republican governors. Mike Steele was the lieutenant governor. He's on the MSNBC so much, people that might not surprise people. He helped me when we were seeking to abolish the death penalty. But the others were Nathan Deal, Stacey Abrams, and I worked with him. And we shrank Georgia's prison system, the most sweeping statewide legislation. Uh, Governor Deal's son is a dr drug court judge, and he really understood viscerally what we needed to do to get more people into rehab. And Stacey Abrams was the minority leader, and we got it done. But in that example, and there were others, uh, Rick Perry down in Texas, we got 50 progressive criminal justice. We would say progressive, the right when we say right on crime. Okay, whatever. We all agree on the legislation. We spent it our own way. Uh, Rick Perry, uh, we, we passed 52. He signed 50 in Speedo 2. Um, Schwarzenegger over in California, you in Virginia. Um, but there's two things that really, that really made me sad. One was that we had no, I, no way to really talk about it. Um, Grover Norquist helped me roll out the NAACP's criminal justice agenda. That may surprise people, but think about it. He's trying to shrink government and prisons keep growing. So, and he's 
he has a Palestinian wife and he's against racial profiling. You know, Grover's a real person. He's more complex than any caricature. But, you know, Nathan Deal was like, man, he's like, Ben, he's like, first rule, let's not take any photos until this is done. <laughs> because we have no way to talk publicly about actually agreeing on something. We've got to figure that one out. We've got to celebrate it when it happens. That's why I wasn't afraid. The other thing was in California, and I grew up in Monterey. My parents' marriage had been against the, had been against the law in Baltimore. And it was illegal to return to Maryland. You know, dad said, look, we already got Loving versus Virginia in the courts. Don't need Jealous versus Maryland, too. <laughs> and they moved out to Northern California. And there I was sitting with Governor Schwarzenegger, who, because of the empathy he had cultivated in uh, gyms with a lot of bodybuilders, by his calculation, he said about half had felon records. Um, we worked together courageously to make it easier for folks to get employed. And he wanted to go further. He wanted to shrink California's prison system so that never again would the state budget for prisons be higher than it was um, for its public universities. In 1970, 3% of California's budget went to prisons and 11% went to public universities. The state's public universities were free and high quality. And there we were in 2010 and there were protests at UC Berkeley, books, not bars. And it, things have flipped. Now 11% of prisons, sick, uh, 7% um, to universities and uh, moderate Democrats in the state legislature uh, aligned, um, frankly, at that point with an out of power, more conservative faction, the prison guards union, union shut that down. And the next year, Jerry Brown would propose 15% for the prisons and 6% for the universities. And there were reasons behind that. There were health crises and stuff in the prisons, but to see Democrats get in the way and a Republican governor stand up, confuse this old civil rights. And it goes to your point, Bob, that we, um, we've got to uh, find a way to get both parties to a place where doing the right thing t together is easy, you know, uh, where we don't try to score political points by shutting down a Republican governor who wants to do the right thing on you know, on prisons or, um, you know, we don't care, you know, create such caricatures where I, as a venture capitalist, was called a socialist by the Republican I was running against with a very expensive ad campaign. It's like being a Democrat doesn't make you a socialist. Being a Republican doesn't make you a racist. Like, can't we all be adults and just talk about ideas? <laughs> yeah, it's, boy, we we need more and more commentary like what I just heard from you, Ben, the rhetoric, the finger pointing, the blame, the Ever putting everybody in a in a box that if you're a Republican or Democrat, you must be, you know, fill in the blank is so great. Let me ask you, though, if you put this in perspective, uh, I really think personally that this issue of, of race is existential for the United States of America. You look at the decline of great civilizations and one of the constants is uh, is the instability and strife and ability for people to get along. You know, you and I talked about this early on in our friendship, and that is by the year 2046, this is a majority non-white nation. If our race relations are still as they are today, we got some real trouble. So yeah, today we got divisions about everything from debt and deficit and immigration, social policies, but where do you see in the overall future of America, where does this issue of racial healing and reconciliation and communication. Where does that fit in the uh, in, in the American conscience about the importance of getting this right? At the end of the day, I think the overwhelming majority of the American people want to be there. Our families are rapidly becoming more mixed. Uh, I was on with an 80 year old conservative leader on the conservative thought hour uh, radio show. He was very excited about his daughter in law. You know, that's black, and um, you know, I'm out at the YMCA in Pasadena, Maryland, conservative community. A lot of guys with conservative movement T-shirts and hats with their black grandchildren that they're investing all their love into. That's not the Maryland that my family had to flee. There's a whole lot of progress in that. And yet the politicians keep making the other side caricatures. And so I really do believe that we have to figure that out. And I'll give you an example of, of one way to figure that out. Although I think it may scare some folk. 
Norm Mineta, when you land in San Jose, you land at Norm Mineta Airport. He was uh, Secretary of Transportation under Clinton. He was Secretary of Transportation under Bush. And part of what set him up for that was his life growing up after returning from the internment camps, essentially American concentration camps, if we're honest. And the, um, he was at a Japanese American Citizens League meeting when he was 12 or 13 years old, and come back from the internment camps. And an elder passed a hat. And he said, uh, we allowed an anti-Japanese American party, he was talking about FDR's Democratic Party, an anti-Japanese American party to rise up in our midst. We can never allow that to happen again. So I'm going to pass my hat. And I'm asking every adult in this room to put as much money as they can into my hat. And I'm going to divide it into two piles. With one pile, we will buy one group of young people tickets to the Republican annual dinner every year. And then next year, I'll ask you to do the same thing. We'll send the same kids. And with the other pile, we'll, we'll send kids to the Democratic Party every year. We'll raise one set of our kids in the Republican Party, one set of the Democratic Party. Part of that, I believe, is why the Japanese succeeded in getting reparations for those internment camps, because they had people in both parties who could build consensus and help explain, and relationships are important. And then Norm would pause, because Northern California is overwhelmingly Democrat, and say, thank God they sent it to the Democratic Party. You know, because <laughs> you wouldn't have had a political future as a Republican uh, in Northern California, given the way things have gone. But, you know, we need more of that. We need to be more intentional uh, about pulling both of these parties back to common sense. Um, it should not be the case uh, that um, our parties, uh, you know, both oftentimes feel like caricatures of themselves and out of touch with our local communities where life is much more complex and nuanced. You know, Ben, one of the things that we've been trying to do in Virginia with Virginia's for reconciliation is to reach out to the major influencers in the culture, get them to find ways to follow the golden rule, to understand each other, to talk to each other, to break bread together, love each other, and then go out and influence the culture. So it's business people, it's educators, it's the government class, it's the lawyers. Uh, what what advice would you give, let's say, to a, the influencers like lawyers, business people? They have immense ability to set the culture and the tone in society. If you give some concrete ideas from all you've learned in writing that book and growing up with your family, what would you tell the audience some practical things to do? One is understand that relationships are everything and everything else is derivative. If we want to pull the society together, we've got to create new re relationships. We are living in polarized time. Every time you create a friendship on the other side of that divide, you are helping to pull this country back together. The second thing I would say is to be a learn-it-all, not a know-it-all. That's something we would say is in, you know, when I was at Caper Capital, and I say to other venture capitalists all the time, is like, don't back the entrepreneurs and know-it-all because the world's constantly changing. Back the one who is a learn-it-all, and they will keep up. And I think a lot of us really feel like we understand American history. I didn't know a thing about the readjusters. I think I vaguely remember there was a footnote in college, and it blew my mind, and all of a sudden it opened up other possibilities. The last thing I would say is to be optimistic, and this is like the afterword of the, of the book gets into this in a much more profound way. But my grandmother had mentored a young social worker named Barbara Mikulski, who would go on to be a U.S. senator. And at the end of my grandmother's life, the last two weeks of her life, I had them on the phone. And it was clear how buoyant and optimistic they were. And I remembered something that my grandmother said to me. She said, uh, optimists win more options. No, excuse me. Pessimists are right more often. Pessimists are right more often. But optimists win more often. As for me, I'll take, I'll take winning. And what she meant was this. She would describe life as a boxing match, like Muhammad Ali in the Rumble in the Jungle. Said, you know, the pessimist is out in four rounds because round one, they say, oh, my God, I'm going to get punched. I'm going to get knocked down. And it happens. And it happens again in round two and round three. And guess what? That's a trend in round four, they throw it. But the optimist gets in like Muhammad Ali. He's like, I'm with George Foreman. Like, that's a given. But maybe this is the round I don't get knocked down. I don't get knocked down. I don't. And that motivates them to get to the 12th. And then a little bell goes off in their head and says, I just got to be the last man standing in this round. It doesn't matter how many times I was knocked down the last 11. And so cultivating that optimism in us, which honestly, everything about elite education, and I'm somebody who's 
gone to Columbia, gone to Oxford, taught at Princeton, and now I teach at Penn. Um, but everything about the culture of those places makes us want to be jaded, makes us want to be know-it-alls, wants to want to be the expert. And it's like, no, show up with that beginner's mindset. Show up eager to learn. Show up aware maybe you don't know everything. And certainly the other person is something to teach you. And that's the best way to live. stay optimistic. You'll have like a lower heart rate in a, in a longer life. <laughs> <laughs> Stress really does turn down the temperature. It also makes you live longer too. All the yeah. Time. Hey Ben, let me ask you about education because uh, you know there's been all kinds of pithy quotes that education obviously is the key to the future, especially for young people that may not have material success. But everybody, at least the Virginia Constitution in most states, say. Everybody's entitled to a free, high-quality public education. You know, one of the great examples a couple of years ago, you, you and I think have talked about this, but Newt Gingrich and Al Sharpton, arm in arm, traveled the country talking about the need to improve educational opportunities for everybody, better public schools, more choices, et cetera. For those that are uh, interested in education, which I think is probably most of this audience and Educators, what message would you have for them that came out of your book about what do we need to do better in that area to be able to lift all the boats for everybody? By the way, new, um, Al Sharpton is uh, Strom Thurmond's cousin. So again, <laughs> if, we're, you know, if we're just transparent and we figure out how to talk about how connected we all are, um, maybe it's less weird that Strom Thurmond's cousin traveled with Newt Gingrich around the country. But... <laughs> um, um, no, you know, what I would say when I figured out about education, and it's a, it's a theme that comes up a lot in the book, is that it's the fastest pathway out of poverty. Yep. You know, you know that from your own family history. I know that from my own family history. My mom started with color homes project, housing projects, but that doesn't ring a bell. If you ever watch The Wire, McCullough homes are referred to as the low rises in The Wire. That's what my mom grew up with. What got her out of there? Well, she was a precocious reader, and her mom just took her to the public library every day. And this summer, we are looking at the likely death knell for affirmative action. California has been dealing with that for a long time. Affirmative action has been banned at public universities in California for a long time. My hope is that the country will also go further than California has in really embracing the need to open up doorways for kids born into poverty. Uh, and really use the public universities to help them leap out. And I talk in the book about a man with a Confederate flag over his heart. And I talked to him about it briefly a few minutes ago, but to dig in a little bit more there, and again, his family come over here, part of the Georgia Penal Colony. The men in the family had gone to prison in every generation. What made him the anomaly was he got a football scholarship to Ole Miss. The Confederate flag was an old, back when that was one of the symbols of the university. And it was a booster shirt. And now here he was an executive. You know, one of the things we'd say at Caper Capital is genius is constant in every zip code. Genius is constant in every zip code. Opportunity is not. And we really, you know, uh, but one of the things I know from our, these universities is that a lot of the black kids who, who are in there come from privileged families, like, like my children will be. And honestly, my kids can go to, you know, when they go to Columbia, they'll be a legacy kid and they'll be able to benefit from that sort of class-based privilege. But what would be a big mistake is if we end affirmative action and yet we do nothing to radically expand access to universities for the poor. And that's what General William B. Mahone and Edward David Bland, who built this movement called the Readjusters in Virginia, and there are parallel movements in other states, that's what they were all about. The former Confederates and the freemen came together. Why? Because they wanted to preserve the free public schools started during Reconstruction. And then what did they go on to do? Radically expand Virginia Tech uh, to make it uh, the powerful engine of opportunity that it, it remains in the Commonwealth and create Virginia State, the first public HBCU in the country. There's wisdom there. Uh, and we need to... I think really understand that we have a moral obligation as Dr. King was trying to teach us to end power. Yeah. Well, your cousin, uh, your distant cousin, Thomas Jefferson said that about a hundred times why he founded the university of Virginia. <laughs> as you yes. know, um, what, um, 
what do we what else do we need to do? If we're gonna move the ball well, forward and then I, uh, start to yeah. wrap up our time here. What what else do we need to do? By the way, let me just say for those of you in the audience that haven't, we have one other question that's just come in. I'll ask Ben in a minute, but what to, we still got some time left. So uh, get your questions in now. If you got a question for Ben Jealous about this uh, consequential book he's written. You know, in the book, Bob, I talked about the three big lies about race and racism. The first, and, we, and we need to understand, we have a shift of thinking about race. Um, the first thing is to understand that race has not always had the same meaning. The word comes in to the European languages as raza in Italian in like the 1100s. And until the early 1700s in the New World, there was the same meaning. Genus or type when applied to things, tribe or nation when applied to people. And then it shifts to the pseudoscientific ranking of all of God's creation. And, and, and the humanoids within that are divided into different races, as if there's not one human race. Of course, the Human Genome Project has proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt. You have the superhuman Anglo-Saxon, somewhere below that, the Irishman. Somewhere way down below that, the subhuman Negro, right? And that was the rap. And that sort of, you know, color and ethnic based, you know, gradation um, was an imposed on our society for in the better part of the last 300 years. But it's important to note it didn't exist for the first 100 years, say from 1619, say to roughly 1720. Well, what happened? What happened was, uh, European indentured servants and African slaves kept rebelling together, and they needed to split into two groups. Military response was effective, but not definitive. Change in laws, effective, but not definitive. The cudgel that is culture, much more effective. Getting the poorest white folks to believe that their greatest asset was their status as a white person uh, got them to distance themselves from enslaved Africans and stop rebelling with them. That's one. Uh, to really understand this is something that we created and why is that important? Because anything we have done, we can undo. Uh, our country, this whole experiment is older than the notion of race, and we can live, we can see the day beyond it. The second thing is this. Um, call it the, the Archie Bunker myth, that white folks are the only people who pay the price for desegregation. Uh, no, you know who else hurt? Mr. Jefferson, Mrs. Jefferson, black folks who own businesses. We lost millions of businesses. And, you know, you've gone through places in Petersburg and Richmond where there used to be thriving black downtowns and they're gone. And we need to tell that story. The third thing, um, the thing that Dr. King gave his life trying to teach us is that racism doesn't just hurt black people, people of color. Racism, again, going back to the first lesson, is a wedge driven between, first between two groups, enslaved Africans and indentured Europeans, but ultimately working class people of color, working class whites. And it diminishes the power of both when it comes to them doing what uh, the con former Confederates and the freemen did in the readjusters, combining efforts in the interests of all their children. And so understanding that helps you understand, okay, well then, who profited from changing the definition of race? Well, at the time of the king and the lords who were trying to stabilize the colonies so they could extract great wealth. And who pays the price today? Every family trapped in poverty because they have fewer allies because they can't unite. And so I mean, us really understanding what Dr. King was trying to teach us that at the end of the day, everybody is hurt. Uh, every community suffers. And our only chance as he was saying in the Poor People's Campaign, to really end poverty really starts is precedented by uniting the poor across lines of color. And I would say that exists for all of us um, outside of the, you know, in the lower 99.9% .9 of the country. <laughs> we all need a, uh, more allies to create a better future for our kids. Yeah, that was an exceptionally good and thoughtful answer, uh, Ben. And we have a commentator and a question that says, I hope you'll get a smile out of this. He said, I'm very impressed by Ben's thoughtfulness. Has he changed over the years? I thought he was more of a political partisan person. So I guess when you run for governor of Maryland or governor of Virginia, there's always politics and people look at that through the lens of an election. But it is true. People that are going through partisan elections can actually be thoughtful friends and find common ground. So did, did writing this book, how did it affect you? How did it change your view as you came? with this reckoning of your 400-year history and 
your relationship with the former uh, uh, head of the Confederacy, Virginia? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right with, you know, um, I'd say like 24 hour news does a job on all of us, right? We go on trying to get our voice out. We got to speak in the sound, but you know, and 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 when you run for office, man, you're just made into a caricature in profound ways. Uh, and then you have to raise tons of money trying to push back on that. Um, yeah, no, it's not not really a big change in me. I think that what changed for me was the amount of information that I had, just about where I came from. And that definitely, um, you know, digging in, really understanding all the connections and the origins gives you a, a, uh, a greater sense of peace groundedness and of pride you know there was a moment in the book where uh going through my dna on a particular line there was a family mythology that we descended from pocahontas a lot of lights can black people in southern virginia think they descend from pocahontas and my grandmother and our and our, and our x chromosome was asian so maybe we just did right two percent african americans have an asian x chromosome 99 percent of those they descend from native americans so maybe we're on to something my daughter's super excited because that's her favorite disney Wow, we're going to prove we're related to Pocahontas. <laughs> so, you know, DNA goes up to Harvard. They say, well, we'll be, be back in touch in six months. Two years later, I call Henry Louis Gates Jr. I'm like, look, man, like, just give me the DNA results. Like, it took me this long. I just figured it out last week. I'll see you in a month. I'll break down everything. I go, I said, sit down with me. Long story short, we have no Native American mutations. We descend from the Polynesians who founded Madagascar. They were pirates when they showed up. Many of them were pirates to this day. And the way our DNA got here was in the belly of a pirate ship uh, because of a war between European pirates and African pirates. I come home to my daughter and I said, baby, uh, we do not descend from Native Americans. She said, not even a little bit. I was like, nope. She's like, Pocahontas, like pure great, you know, great-grandma mythology. She says, uh, well, do you have any good news to us? Yeah, we descend from pirates. She said, oh, daddy, that's way cooler. That's way cooler. I think all of us need to really dig into what DNA, what Ancestry.com, even what funny sayings from our elders can tell us about where we come from. You tell a story in there about a, a guy who swore he was just white, Bob, and he kept making a sound and he thought it was just a sound that dad made, that granddad made. That sound was actually a curse in old Irish. His therapist figured it out using Google and just putting in the sound phonetically. And it came back. The guy suddenly realized he was Irish, as you know. You're a member of the Irish diaspora. You have a connection to traditions, and history, and little villages, and all kinds of things that give you a sense of grounding in this world, and of pride, and of shared experience. It accelerated the man's therapy and improved his mental health. Uh, and it made it more interesting to himself. And so if I've benefited from writing this book, that's the way that I've benefited. I feel more grounded. I feel like I have a better sense of where my folks came from. And at the very least, it helped me make sense of the one thing my grandmother kept saying that completely confounded me. That's the title of the book. Never forget our people will always free. Maybe we got time for just a couple last questions. One of the uh, listeners writes in response to something you said. He said, are our divides really more racial or are they really more class? We have to understand what Dr. King was trying to teach us. That, that, that poverty both lives upstream and downstream from racism. Uh, that, um, you know, in the, in the beginning in Gloucester, Virginia, not far from Fort Monroe, um, uh, there was a rebellion in 1663, 13 years before Bacon's rebellion that is heralded because it's 100 years before the revolution. By the way, that's the same place where uh, Dr. King wrote the Emancipation. I have a dream speech under that uh, tree there. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, no, I've been in touch with uh, Mr. Kelly, who runs it. I'll be down there in Gloucester. And we need to talk about that, too. And I'll be down at Fort Monroe. I hope you'll join me. But, but the, um, you know, there was the first rebellion in the colonies. And it was European indentured servants. And it was African slaves together. And uh, ultimately, racism as we know it, race as we understand it, were created to drive a wedge between those groups of people. And so they were poor before race was created. And then when the definition changed and this new colonial pecking order was created and with it a new type of racism, 
poverty was maintained. And so it's, it's about both. It depends kind of what you're sort of talking about, the particular family, the history. But as a society, I would say there's no real ending poverty without at least moving beyond the lines of race. Another, another listener, Ben, says genius is present in every zip code. Opportunity is not. How do we fix it? The number one thing is to really make public education work everywhere and, and be like Lorraine Jobs is in the Silicon Valley, for instance. It's just impatient with it. You know, impatient with, Bob, you know, it breaks your heart. You know, I had to, I'm a proud product of public schools, but they started to fail me in high school. My parents pushed me into a Episcopalian school. That's our faith. Um, my son uh, is on the spectrum. He's high, he has very high intelligence. He's very high functioning on the autism spectrum. And you would think the people at school who are educational experts would recognize that they didn't. They threatened me when he was seven years old to call the police. Because he, he had separation anxiety, kept running out the front door trying to get in my car. And he said, well, you know, we're near a busy street. If he does that again, we'll have to call the police. I thought they were bluffing. Bob, there was a lawsuit filed a year later, that two years earlier. So a year be before the incident in Montgomery County, Maryland, one of the richest school districts in the country, they called the police on a five-year-old black boy with separation anxiety. We'll let him away in chains. And you know what that does to a child. And so... Um, We've got to really, and then I had to pull my kid up because there's no way I'm letting the police officer put their hands on my seven-year-old because he has autism. And so we've got to really figure this out. The flip side is half of the wealthiest men I know in the Silicon Valley have high-functioning autism. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you can't throw away my kid either because he has high-functioning autism. You don't get, uh, you know, Microsoft without men on the spectrum. You know, it just doesn't work that way. And so um, I think fundamentally, like the readjusters taught us, the foundation for pulling everybody together is public education, making it work for all of our kids, and then going for, further with public higher education and making it work for all of our communities. It's the fastest path we're going to find. Man, we got time uh, for maybe one minute left for an answer. Let me ask you this, Dr. King. 60 years ago now, it's hard to believe, uh, had that dream about uh, his kids being judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. By the way, Martin Luther King holiday was first proclaimed in about 20 years ago by a Republican governor of Virginia. So <laughs> I found that interesting. We're all uh, doing some things right. Let me ask you, how, how well are we doing towards creating the meritocracy that Dr. King envisioned? And what's What's the one bit of parting advice you've got for all the listeners here in San Francisco about what they can do in their own lives? I'd say the persistent poverty in our country is the boldest reminder we have failed to make Dr. King's dream real. He was assassinated leading a poor people's campaign seeking to end it. Really dig into that, understand that. If you want to understand what Dr. King wanted his legacy to be and then figure out how to help change that. Um, what I would say to, to folks, and what I want people to walk away from this book, you know, friends and listeners in San Francisco, um, is fundamentally to recognize that it's going to take all of us to pull this country back together, to be courageous in your own lives. If you're in corporate America, I would say this. My dad is an old white guy, I would say, um, you know, who spent his life supporting women and people of color in their movements. It's the best way to diversify. Uh, your company is to do two things. One is to really back women, really back people of color in the way that you've backed white men in your career. We all know what that looks like. Um, back them. Don't give them advice. Just back them. Don't give them a chance. They have a saying for that in Mississippi. It's give the boy enough rope to hang himself. No, not a chance. Back them. And that means multiple chances. The other thing I'd say is to recognize that if you become a leader in inclusion, uh, you develop new friendships, you become more interesting to yourself. One of the hardest chapters of the book is about the impact of social isolation on privileged white men. It's called a pandemic ignore. The suicide rate amongst white men over 55 is higher than the homicide rate. Black boys 15 to 30. Why is in the book? But the point is this. Um, if you want to uh, live a better life, want to live a longer life as an old white guy like my dad, what my dad would tell you is get out there and 
uh, you know, try to do what Bob's doing, try to create recon racial reconciliation, create new friendships, become a champion for people who don't look like you in some way in, in your life. It will transform your life. You'll be invited to new parties. You'll have more fun. And there's nothing wrong with getting something, something out of, you know, having more fun while pulling our country back together. Man, I hate to say it, our hour and five minutes has flown. <laughs> My friend, I have loved our 10-year friendship, 10-year friendship, and I've loved the last hour with you. And I, I just encourage everybody to get a, a copy of uh, Ben's book, Never Forget. Our people were always three. It's on Amazon. You can get it at bookstores. It's a consequential life written by a person of high intellect, high character, who's got one goal, and that is to be civil and find ways to change people's heart, to work together. Ben, I love your philosophy built on the great golden rule and the principles that Dr. King laid out so, uh, so eloquently to us during his uh, all too short lifetime. I want to encourage all of you, you can, uh, if you had fun this first time, you can watch us again. Uh, go to the website of the Commonwealth Club at www.commonwealthclub.org. You can see it again. We encourage you to uh, watch future programs. It's been a delight to be on with Ben to MC this uh, program today. Gold be golden rule, people. Help change America for the better. I'm Governor Bob McDonald. I've enjoyed being on with you today. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everybody who listens. And Bob, thank you for that decade of friendship. It's been a real gift. Appreciate you. More to come.